Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now if you're looking to build a new PC this year, then there's a chance you might go for a 12th generation Intel based build. Whether you opt for an i3 or i9, you'll be getting a decent CPU that can handle the latest games just fine, albeit with varying levels of performance. If however, you don't care about that or you're on a very tight budget, there are other options. Well, the Pentium G7400 sounds pretty good and I'll be testing one as soon as I can find one, things do get even lower end and today we'll be taking a look at the latest Celeron chip, the G6900. The lowest of the Alder Lake lineup is based of course on the new 1700 socket, comes with a new style heatsink and because this is a very low end part it makes the most sense to pair it with the cheapest motherboard you can find. I've gone with the Gigabyte H610M S2H DDR4 which works with this chip straight out of the box. You can slap this into a DDR5 motherboard if you want to but it doesn't really make sense considering that this is intended for basic usage. I've read numerous articles about how the Golden Cove cores are so good that this thing can match an i9-10900K in single threaded performance. Now my Geekbench result wasn't quite as good as the one I've seen but I am running the chip at stock speeds with 16 gigabytes of 3000 megahertz DDR4 in dual channel. Even so, this is older i9 and Ryzen 9 territory in terms of the single core result. But, and it is a big but, you have to remember that this is still a Celeron with two cores and no hyper-threading in 2022. Why that's the case, I don't know. I'd have liked to have seen hyper-threading now and maybe a bump up to four physical cores for the Pentium, but it is what it is and no matter how hard you might be able to push it on an expensive board, well the two physical cores are going to prove very limiting. Don't get me wrong, general usage wise, it's fine, I mean, there's no point spending more on a socket 1700 ball to get this over a G5900 on a socket 1200 board, but if you plan to upgrade later on, and are happy to use this in the meantime, it will do just fine. So shall we see if it can game? I'm not going to complain too much about the following results, if I can help it because it isn't meant for what I'm about to put it through, but if you happen upon one of these and you do want to fire up the odd game of Fortnite or explore Los Santos, can you? I've paired mine with an NVIDIA T1000 which is similar in performance to a GTX 1650 GDDR6 card. This will still allow the chip to reach its maximum potential gaming wise and hopefully give you a good idea of what to expect. Because the Golden Cove cores are pretty decent, the average frame rates that this thing can pump out are respectable. And I can't wait to see how the Pentium G7400 improves on this when I can find one. The lack of hyper-threading however means that the 1.1% lows are awful in most cases. The Witcher 3 for example runs at the high settings with low post-processing and it often exceeds 60 FPS, but there are a lot of freezes and stutters. But it's not all bad, or it's not all this bad I should say. GTA San Andreas The Definitive Edition again demonstrates a decent enough average, and while the frame dips and stutters can certainly be attributed to physical core count, the percentile readings weren't quite as bad as they were before. Now 15 and 2 respectively don't sound very good, but the game certainly felt playable to an extent and there were no micro freezes. The Witcher 3 often froze completely, and even though most of the time this wasn't for more than a second or two, it did certainly hurt the experience a lot more. Here the frame dips come across as a moderate frustration as opposed to game breaking, at least in my opinion, so if you do build your nan a basic system and she decides she wants to mow down some ballers in a modified lowrider, well she should be able to relatively problem free. Cyberpunk 2077 won't load any save games because of the two cores. This issue was fixed for hyper-threaded CPUs, but two physical cores just don't cut it. This is all you get. 
Now that said, you can start a new game, but you won't be able to resume where you left off, so it seems kind of pointless. I did want to showcase the performance of the game on the Celeron anyway, because it's not as bad as I thought it would be, at least not in the Badlands. Night City is probably a whole other story, but if this dual core problem does ever get fixed, it's nice to know that you should be able to get away with playing Cyberpunk, sort of, with this processor, at least for the opening part of the story. Okay, so CSGO here performs with at least 100 frames per second. We have set the game to the lowest preset at 1080p. As you can probably tell, the Celeron is maxing out at 100% a lot of the time, as you can see from the uh, on-screen MSI Afterburner stats. Just as I've said that, it's actually dipped to around 60 or 70. The CPU is staying pretty cool, however. The new cooler from Intel is pretty decent. It's a little bit audible, but it's a big improvement over the older ones that we used to get, so there is that. And in terms of CSGO here, when paired with the T1000 or, of course, the GTX 1650, which will offer near-identical performance, yeah, it's, it's okay. Now, in a competitive situation like this, you might find it problematic because all of a sudden you might get a frame dip out of nowhere, and that can mean the difference between getting the kill and getting killed. Now, we do actually have new integrated graphics with this chip, UHD 710 graphics, but I won't be testing them today because I don't think that the Celeron can get the most out of them. The Pentium G7400, which I'm still looking for, also has these graphics, so I'll probably be testing those out when I can actually get my hands on that, just to show you what those can do, because I don't think they're found on the i3. It's only the Celeron and Pentium that has these graphics, but as I say, I'll be sure to benchmark those when I can find the better chip. Fortnite here with the Celeron is a little bit stuttery, it's uh, it's performing a little better here in this building than it would on the outside, I have to say. Let's just snipe. Oops, not as powerful as I thought, this sniper here. But it is running at over 100 FPS. Oh, is that an actual... There we go. Let's just uh, take them out. There we go. Come on, that's it. Yeah, so it's playable. You can wipe people out quite easily. Just be aware that like pretty much every other game, there will be frame dips when you don't want frame dips. And as you can see once again, the G6900 is pinned at 100% usage. When it comes to Forza Horizon 5, this is about as good as it gets. 44 FPS, which isn't bad, but we are jammed on the loading screen, so yeah. It's a favourite now amongst the benchmarks, GTA 5. We tested this with the G5900 as well last year or the year before. We didn't get an 11th gen Celeron, I don't think. it's. Uh, we had a 10th gen G5900 and now we've got the 12th gen G6900. You're going to experience similar problems here that than you would, um, or as you would with the G5900, in that there's going to be a lot of stutters, as you can tell by the frame time graph, which is all over the place. Let's just pull you out of the car there. I mean, what was I even expecting with Far Cry 6? I was expecting more than 2 FPS, but we can't win them all. This was actually hilariously bad. Um, I thought that the game had some sort of issue. I actually reinstalled it to try it again with the seller on here. The first time um, I fired it up, it actually crashed to the system and I thought it wouldn't run on a two core CPU, but it does. Uh, it runs at least, but it's, it's not what I would call playable at all. Even when you look up towards the sky to try and get an extra frame or two out of the game, well, it's having none of it. Two FPS was about the most I saw. <laughs> So the last game test today is Red Dead Redemption 2, and this is perhaps the most surprising result. Now, Red Dead 2 really doesn't care about the fact that we've got two cores. I thought my horse was going to die then. The G5900 a couple of years ago ran it just as well. It really doesn't care. The, the two cores are, are good enough for the game. Even when we get near Valentine, the CPU usage does shoot up, and the frame rate does dip below 30 as expected. But it's nowhere near as bad as I thought, and this is actually what I would consider playable, to be honest. Um, at least if you're happy with 30 frames per second. 60 FPS is out of the question with these Xbox One X equivalent settings on this GPU anyway. As you can see, it's performing pretty well. The CPU isn't even pinned at 100%, and I like to think that the Pentium that we'll test will perform even better than this. 
I also mentioned before that we do have new integrated graphics UHD 710 with this CPU. I'll be testing those with the Pentium whenever I can find one. I don't think that's been released yet, at least not here, but the Celeron for basic usage, just like the 10th gen Celeron, is fine. It's fine if you want to build an elderly relative a PC, uh, but then again, I'd still try and find something with four cores, to be quite honest, or the Pentium that I've mentioned many times now. This is it for this review then. The motherboards, the 1700 motherboards at the moment, even basic H610 ones, are still quite a bit more expensive, at least here, than socket 1200 ones. So it probably doesn't make much sense to go for one of these over the G5900 at the moment, but there we are. If you enjoyed this one, leave a like on it. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Let me know what you think of this CPU down below, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.